Live family, hello, good evening. I pray that all is well and that God is blessing you and keeping you. As you well know, we are in our study of James, um, and uh, we are now in chapter 2. And so what I want to do, because everyone uh, who's on right now wasn't able, some may not have been able to get to log on with us um, on Sunday, I'm going to help fill in the blanks for you in your workbooks on what we discussed on Sunday morning. So uh, we talked about James. Let's let's do a little bit of reading first. Uh, look at James. Let's let's start in James chapter two. And for those who are joining in on um, with us, we're we're going to piggyback on what we talked about Sunday morning to catch those who weren't able to get on Sunday morning. Um, we're going to catch them up with where we are. So in James chapter two, let's do a little more reading. It says, "Hey, Miss Adams." It says, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes to your assembly with a gold ring and, a, and dressed in fine clothing, and there comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? And so we, we looked at uh, favoritism being uh, one who judges a person from outward uh, factors and not from an internal merit. So that's how we define and how, the, how it, actually the Bible defines um, showing favoritism, that you look at a person and you judge a person externally without having internal merits. You know, God, you, you oftentimes use the Bible will speak of God doesn't look at the outward appearance of man, but he looks at what? The heart. And so in essence, the same is true or should be true for the child of God. We should never make rash judgments on people um, based on what we see externally. What we ought to be doing is seeing people for who they are internally. And once you get to see what that person is about in, from internal circumstances or factors, helps you to make proper discernment concerning things. But what James is dealing with here is a judgment upon brothers or fellow Christians with evil motives. Now, what I would say is when he talks about uh, hold, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favor, favoritism, it really means, James is really saying, you cannot by one hand, say that you have faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of glory, and then at the same time, show personal favoritism, right, towards your fellow Christian uh, brother and sister in Christ. Now, he's going to elaborate a little more on that in just a moment. But one of the scriptures, a couple of scriptures I want you to uh, write down is Romans chapter 2, verse 11, and Ephesians chapter 6. In verse number nine, let's let's look at those two uh, rather quickly. Romans chapter two and verse uh, number 11. And then let's look at we'll move from there to Ephesians chapter six, verse nine. Well, let's pick up in um, what James, uh, excuse me, not James, Paul, what Paul does in Romans chapter two is he he deals with the moralist who would suggest that he is, he because he is better morally um, than the next man, that he is exempt from what Paul's dissertation has to deal with, or Paul's discussion. Um, he is exempt from being uh, one of sin. So notice what Paul does, though. In verse 5, he says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person 
according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immorality, immortality excuse me, and eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation, distress for every soul of man who does, who does evil, for the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor, peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now look at verse 11. For there is no partiality with God. You see that? So now he's saying God doesn't show partiality. God isn't one who, uh, who makes judgments um, on a person and, and, and excludes another. God looks at all men across the board. And God makes righteous judgments upon uh, mankind. Now let's run over to Ephesians chapter 6 really uh, quickly. Ephesians chapter 6. And notice, um, let's look, let's pick up at verse, let's pick up at verse 5. He says, slaves be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart, as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleases, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Even masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. Watch this. And there is no partiality with him. So even Paul instructs even slaves on how to handle their servants. And he says, make and even servants how to handle slaves, even if they may be unruly. He tells them, listen. There is no partiality with God. Therefore, you and I must not show partiality towards each other. Treat all men equally. Now, the question then arises, why would, favor, why would showing favoritism be destructive to the faith? In the workbook, for those who may not have the workbook with them, the question is, why would showing favoritism be destructive to the faith? Now, write this down. Number one, it contradicts God who looks favorably upon all men. It contradicts, or you can say it contradicts the character and attitude of God towards the downtrodden or the less fortunate. So it contradicts God and his character and attitude towards the less fortunate. Then secondly, it shows an ex favoritism shows an exaggerated flattery and affection for others. It shows an exaggerated flattery and affection towards others in our content in our text it would show an exaggerated flattery uh, and affection for, for the wealthy. Because notice, he says, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dresses in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothing, uh, you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and you say, sit here in a, a good place, and you say to the poor uh, man, you stand over here and sit down at, by my footstool or at my footstool. So now what James does, James, he cuts all of that uh, out of the Christian faith and out of the Christian uh, personal walk with God by showing you are not to show favoritism. Now, here's two, here's two aspects of this, because he'll go on to say you judge with evil motives. Now, what is James after? He is showing it could mean that here they come into the worship assembly of Christians and they are showing favoritism 
in a pejorative way. That simply means they are showing favoritism <clears throat> because of what they see outwardly. They have come with a biased opinion and motive towards this wealthy person. All right, they judge them by what they see, how they dress, what are they wearing, and then they make a judgment on uh, upon them so as to make a unrighteous judgment upon the poor man. Now, that's when they come into the assembly. But this can also have to do with when we make judgments um, in, uh, un, let's say, unrighteous judgments when it comes to handling matters or uh, disputes between Christians. Now, let's look at, because what the, in, in part of the context, this could also show that when Christians have disputes, they come together to settle the disputes. But because the, there is one who is rich, you show partiality to him in terms of your making the right judgment to handle the dispute. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians, I think it is chapter... Let me get over there. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is it not? Let me get there, y'all. Yeah. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And let's look at verse 1. He says, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you not con uh, competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? In other words, you should be, because of the magnitude of who we are, we should be able to settle disputes among Christians, right? But then notice what he goes on to say. So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren. But brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. Actuality, actually, then is, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wrong and why not rather be defrauded? Or on the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. And you do this even to your brothers. Now notice, he's saying the judgment or the disputes ought to be handled between Christians, right? But in handling the disputes, you must make sure that you do not show partiality towards your fellow brother because that person is wealthy and because the poor man uh, poor or poor Christian uh, does not have uh, is of meager, meager means. Another way of looking at it, you often see this sometimes with Christians when they have when Christians have disputes, and there is a third party, and that third party is friends or has a close relationship with one of the parties in dispute. And usually, when we bring in the third party who has a close relationship with one of the persons in dispute, usually. What happens, that third party takes sides with the, the Christian that they have the, the closer relationship with. Well, even in handling disputes, we must call right, right, and wrong, wrong, even if it has to do with someone we're close to in the church. Are y'all here? Y'all got what I'm saying? Am I making sense to you? So the, the crux of the matter is to make sure that we are people who are, are just like God, where we show no partiality. Where wrong is wrong, we got to speak that wrong is wrong, even if it comes to a person that's close to us. Right is right, and we've got to make sure that we use proper discernment and judgment when handling even disputes amongst Christians. Now, so notice, excuse me. Drop down, it says favoritism in your workbook. It says favoritism is exemplified 
the proof of your of, of their guilt. Now I skip number two, but simply put, when he means by the faith, it is the thing to be believed. It is the body of Christian teachings that brings a person to a saved relationship with Christ and also governs the Christian's life even after he has given his life to the Lord. Favoritism exemplified. Let's, uh, when we looked at 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, let's look at Leviticus chapter 9, 19 verse number 15. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 19, and let's, we'll begin at verse number 15. Notice what the Bible says. It says, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great. But you are to judge your neighbor fairly. You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you are not to act against the, uh, against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen. Notice where the hate is. In his heart. And you may surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. Notice the, 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 uh, the wisdom in using sound judgment. And the wisdom in discerning or how God wants us to handle each other. But not only uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, but our neighbor as well. Um, the, here's what I want you to write down. When he talks about, because James will talk about obeying the royal law. What I want you to write down is the law, this royal law has at its heart love for your neighbor. The royal law has at, it, at its heart love for your neighbor. And then secondly, to violate this law means we delude ourselves about our relationship with God. Because think about it, James says these distinctions that the church has made at this time and even we do that we are uh, guilty of making in the church today. He says these distinctions and this partiality that we've we've uh, shown actually comes from an evil heart, evil intent, evil motives. As a matter of fact, during the first century, what was happening in the, in the church that James is writing to Oftentimes, uh, because the poor couldn't pay its couldn't pay their debts, oftentimes they would they would appease to the rich or to the wealthy to help try to get rid of their debt or to uh, give some type of forbearance or leniency on their debt. Much of what you see today, a lot of what you see today. Notice with this crisis going on. Notice what takes place. And I was just li listening to a, uh, a presentation um, earlier today from a guy who was explaining how we have to be careful as homeowners and that you don't get sucked into the idea that you don't have to pay your mortgage simply because because at the end of the day, the banks will, if it's three months later, they're going to ask for everything up front, right? And so what happens we lose, we, we, if you buy into that, you'll stand to lose your home, maybe your car, and everything else. And so, in a, in a sense, this actually happened with the first century church. So what, did they, what do they do? They go to appease the, the wealthy, but it was the wealthy who would raise the interest rates. It was the wealthy who would show no leniency or compassion, and they would lose, the poor man would lose what he had. And so James says, what is the logic in going to the wealthy and showing favoritism to them when you still don't win? As a matter of fact, 
James would say, here is the real logic. Remember in verse 1, he says, Brethren, do not hold your faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism, the glorious Lord, the Lord who is glory. So what James is honing in on is when a Christian understands who it is that, it, that in my own life that I'm supposed to show favoritism to, it's only Jesus. Are you seeing what I'm saying? The only person that I'm to elevate is Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, not man. You see that? I'm not to show partiality. Now, I'm supposed to show partiality. Watch this. When it comes to my relationship with Jesus, then I show partiality to the world. Matter of fact, the world doesn't, in, in privy or they don't have uh, access to this relationship that I have with Jesus. Jesus is the one that I show partiality to in terms of the world, right? So when the world pulls at me, when the world tugs at me, and when uh, it, it, it's trying to trap me or suck me back into worldly thinking and carnal thinking, well, partiality says to the world, uh -uh, my loyalty is only to this glorious Jesus. And as a result, I don't show favoritism to man, nor do I show an exaggerated affection for people who are wealthy. My, my affection is only to this glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. That makes sense? All right. So now, no, what's the next question? On what basis? Look at number two. Well, the example of favoritism, what example of favoritism does James give in the context? He gives... Uh, the, con uh, the example of a wealthy man or fine dressed man coming into their assembly and it actually means to look at one with favor so they look at this wealthy man with a certain level of favor and they disdain the uh, they show disdain rather towards the poor man and then number two he says on what basis are they showing this favoritism now remember that, that favoritism is only looking at external factors, right? So that's the basis on which they, they show favoritism is that they look at the external and not the internal. So what, what do those who show favoritism or partiality become according to James? Look, let's look at verse 4. He says, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges, watch this, with evil motives? So what have they actually become? When you make this type of distinction, what do you become? You become a judge. You see that? Now notice, here's what James means by them becoming a judge. It literally means to show, or let me say it this way, you show such partiality that you claim what is rightfully and exclusively God's. In other words, you have taken the place of God and you now become the judge, right? So now you're judging. Well, look at, look at how, how bad that is. You and I may run the risk of judging someone externally when you and I don't have the discernment of God to judge a man's heart. Are you seeing that? Think about, think about why racism runs so rampant in our communities and in our country and in this world, really. Because people make preconceived judgments about another because of their skin color, right? Because of their education, because of, uh, because of where they may live, perhaps. And I think that's... Um, that's one of the stereotypes that you all who are who may be educators can speak to. You can look at a young man who may have locks in his head, and that young man may end up being a straight-A student. That young man may end up being the very one who goes and graduates from Harvard or Yale, right? So what happens in our society, they bought into this lie that Satan has given, and that is to prejudge people externally, when you don't know what's in their heart internally, right? So when he says you have made yourself the judge, James is saying when you judge a person in such a manner, then what you've done is you've replaced God and you've taken away from God what, which is rightfully his and exclusively God's, and that's judgment. You got me? 
All right, so he says, uh, let's see. Uh, now, that's rhetorical. You all can answer that on your own. But, of course, we show partiality today. And then uh, in what areas uh, or on what basis do we show this partiality? Um, last Sunday, I, I made the um, I wrote down a few things. We show partiality in wealth, education, race, sex. Right. We even and, and in some cases, Christians have to be careful that you don't show partiality and show disdain for your for a fellow brother, and sister in Christ because of their political belief. Right. <laughs> I've seen that across the board where so many Christians, some don't even speak to each other because one is a Republican and the other is a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Failing to re failing to realize that God is neither. God in the Republican or Democrat. But we've made such distinctions and partialities in, in our Christian fellowship that many of us, we don't even talk with one another. Relations have had, relationships have actually been severed because of one's political party that they, they are a part of. So then, here's, here's, here's another nugget I want you to write down. Consistent Christian conduct Consistent Christian conduct comes from a consistent Christian heart and mind. Consistent Christian conduct comes from a consistently Christian heart and mind. That's why I love what Paul would say, and I often quote it from time to time. Paul says, let this mind be in you. In other words, constantly be letting this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus in Philippians 2. So in, in essence, a consistent Christian conduct comes from a consistently Christian heart and mind. All right, let's move on. Let's make sure I haven't left anything off for you. So, from verses 5 through 13, we look at favoritism is refuted. The respect of persons, and we've looked at much of this, respect of persons is against the law of God. Now, there are three major reasons that he has in the workbook as to why um, this is against the law of God, or favoritism is against the law of God. One, because they are chosen by God. Secondly, they are rich in faith. And then third, uh, they are heirs of the kingdom. And I'm getting a notice, um, y'all, that this session will end in 10 minutes. Ah, uh, really? <laughs> and then it's telling me to upgrade. So uh, I guess I got some other work to do, y'all. Well... Let's let's uh, let's move quickly then to uh, refuted by God's choice. It contradicts God's attitude towards others. Now write down Ephesians chapter four. I'm at Ephesians chapter one, verse four. How does God's choice show the folly of favoritism? It contradicts contradicts God's attitude towards others. In other words, we are to see others from a spiritual perspective and not material, right? Another way of looking at it, we must view people as God views people. What are the blessings of that choosing? Well, according to 1 Corinthians chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, verse 26 through 31, uh, one of the blessings is we are now in Christ. And then another blessing or other blessings to that is we have become, we've been made righteous, we are sanctified, and we are redeemed. And then on, under uh, refuted by logic, why was it not logical for them to show favoritism to the rich? Because it was the same rich that mistreated and showed ill will towards them. 
But here's another here's another piece to why it, it was illogical for them to show favoritism. We are not to give undue uh, difference to the rich at the expense of the poor. All right. We are not to give undue difference to the rich at the expense of the poor. Can you see that happening in our world right now? How how um, even with this virus, um, how the African American community is affected by this? Look at the look at our schools. How many, some of our schools in certain neighborhoods aren't afforded uh, the best um, material and and um, things that our school teachers need. But notice it. But notice in wealthy places. They have everything they need. It even shows in our society, not just in the church, um, that that the rich are given are shown a, a, a preferential uh, differences and, and and perks at the expense of poor of the poor. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. What do you think is meant by the phrase honorable or worthy? In other words, it's the name bestowed on the child of God, right? You and I are Christians. You and I represent Christ. And so he says the wealthy, they dishonor this name. And then we refute uh, this, this uh, favoritism uh, refuted by the royal law. It violates, write this down, it violates the law of love. And then I'm going to give you some quick some scriptures to quickly jot down. And we may come back to this and revisit this at the next time. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. And Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. So discovering the royal law is by reading Leviticus 19, verse 18. Mark chapter 12, verse 31, in connection with James 2 and 8. And I've gave you, given you some other ones to look at. But really, in, a, in, 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 in hindsight, it, it really speaks to loving your neighbor as yourself. And then, if I can, quickly define this royal law. This royal law simply means the law that belongs to the king. It's royal, right? Because we belong to the king, we fulfill and uphold the law that he's given. What is it in this text? Treating your neighbor as yourself. We fulfill the king's law. Alright, so my friends, I will pick up right here. We'll pick up right here and move on into the remaining of chapter 2. But I want to say a quick prayer. Hopefully I still have some time before I cut off. I hate I got to rush through this, y'all. But they gave me this notice that popped up on the screen. So I'll do my upgrades after we get off. And, and maybe that'll give us more time. I didn't know that. Um, okay. Oh, uh, well, my helpers here said I can if you want to. I can continue it on Facebook and uh, YouTube. So I'll do that. All right. So... Uh, you guys, God bless. If you're able to keep going with us, do that. But I'll continue it on Facebook Live since and YouTube Live since we still have that going. All right. God bless y'all. Okay, well, hello, Facebook, and hello, YouTube. Let's continue with what we're studying. Now, I've given a couple of scriptures, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 27, and Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 through 40. And um, I've just given a brief definition of what James means by this royal law. That is the law of the king. That is the, the law that, that the king has mandated. And in a nutshell, what James is honing in on is that we are to love our brother as our, or our neighbor as ourselves. In other words, you fulfill and uphold 
the, the royal law when you actually put faith with action. So now, let's do a little bit of reading. Back in James chapter 2, he says in verse 5, Listen, my beloved brother, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. And is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So then, James is now driving at, um, remember earlier he said that those who show partiality, has, we've actually made ourselves a judge. But now, James is flipping the coin by showing us that now, if you and I show partiality, we fail to show or treat our neighbor as ourselves, then guess what? God steps in and he becomes the judge. Now the royal law, the thing that we were commanded to uphold, now becomes our judge. Now, notice, he says, uh, well, write this down. We will have to give an account of our actions against the standard of God's law. We will have to give an account against the standard of God's law. Now, James does something else. He, 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 he cuts down on their ability to make excuses. And that, well, perhaps I, I, I do everything else, but I'm guilty of just this particular law or aspect. If that would be the case, then the only thing that uh, they would be guilty of is not, uh, or uh, be guilty of the sin of showing partiality to their, their brother and sister in Christ. But James does something interesting. He takes the law of Moses and he shows them that just by the law of Moses, if you break one of those commandments, you're guilty of the whole thing. Now, while you and I know that Christians aren't under the law of Moses, what is James driving at? James is showing that to not show uh, love to your fellow brother or sister in Christ, to show partiality towards them, he says, then you... Just like under the law, you have actually offended God himself or the king himself. How so? Because it's the royal law. It's the law given by the king. So now you've offended Christ. You're guilty of, 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 of Christ's law, this royal law, by not um, treating your brother and sister fairly. Now, how would having respect of persons violate the law? Because it goes against love and the compassion of God. And then you can write down next to this, it actually, partiality actually violates our new covenant obligations to God and to our fellow man. You remember the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, the lawyer says, listen, Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And, and uh, Jesus begins to list some things. He says, I've done all of these things and all of these things I've done from since my youth. And Jesus says, well, there's one thing, go and sell all you have to the poor. Well, you remember on another occasion, he was asked, well, who the guy in terms of trying to justify himself, he says, well, who is my neighbor? And then you remember Jesus then gives a parable of the, of the Samaritan who, 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 uh, who looked out for the gentleman who was hurt, left for dead. Jesus says, now, what is Jesus driving at? Jesus is saying, not only um, does God consider your Jewish brothers your neighbor, but also those who are without the law. Those who are not your Jewish brother can be considered your neighbor. And if you fail 
to uh, to treat them fairly. And if you fail to uphold the royal law, then you have made yourself a judge. And in turn, judgment ensues you. Here's what we take away from this. We as a body of people, we as Christians, a body of Christians that is, we must build a counterculture in which kingdom values are lived out and not the world's values. The church must be a people who are building a counterculture in which kingdom values are lived out instead of the world's values. Judge refuted, uh, a favoritism is refuted by judgment, verses 12 through 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. How does James instruct Christians to readers to speak and act? As those who are to be judged. It literally, re, it literally means um, so speak and act as those who are being judged are going to be judged. So James says, listen, you are to speak and you are to act as if you are under judgment right now of this law. Why does he instruct them to do this? Because they are facing judgment. Now, Here's what I want you to get. You and I, God, you and I don't work to be free. Once you give your life to the Lord, you are free in Christ. But that freeing up in Christ has actually freed us to work. So you aren't working or meritoriously for salvation, but you are freed up to work. You are freed up from the shackles of sin by the graciousness of God to actually be a servant in his kingdom. How does showing mercy relate to the example of favoritism given by James? Well, this mercy involves not simply a concern, but an actual uh, act or acts of care and compassion. So, you remember when James, look at verse uh, chapter 1, verse 27. James says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans, widows, and their distress, and to keep oneself unstained uh, by the world. The word visit there isn't just simply an occasionally checking up on someone. It is. It actually means one who cares, who seeks the well-being of another. And so mercy in that regard involves not simply a concern for your neighbor, but an actual act or acts of care and compassion. So you aren't just talking the talk, you are, you are walking the talk, if you will. You are living out who you are as a child of God. Well, I'm going to end here, but I want you to write down Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, and Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Here's what I want, us, want you to take away. Christians will be judged based on the conformity to the will of God expressed in Christ's teachings. God's graciousness and acceptance of us does not negate our obedience to him. I want you to keep that in mind. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go into the furtherance of chapter 2 and we'll start to look at uh, this faith in, faith in action and this faith uh, without works. And we'll have to 
uh, thoroughly define what James means by works. Faith without works is dead. What does James mean by that? Um, and does he mean the same thing that Paul meant? Or is he speaking against what the Apostle Paul spoke about concerning works in the book of, in, in the epistle of Romans? So I would venture not, but I think it's a good study for us to get into. Um, I apologize for whatever inconvenience and hiccups with our, um, for those who were on Zoom with us, but we will, we will take care of that and get to the bottom of that. But I want to say thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us this evening uh, with our Bible study. And just remember, uh, Sunday morning, we will have Sunday morning worship at 10. We'll have Bible study again at 9 a.m. Um, and we'll have all three aspects working, Zoom, uh, uh, Facebook Live, YouTube, and also Instagram Live. So we'll have those elements working. So God bless you. Let me say a quick prayer for all of those. God, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your blessing us with the study of your word. I thank you, Father, for life itself. Thank you, Father, for uh, what your son Jesus has accomplished on the cross for us. And I thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that you've given us to indwell in us and to, and to guide us. Father, I thank you for your word, which is able to save our souls. Father, I pray that you will bless us as we study James to be uh, not only hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Father, we're asking in a special way that you bless this uh, city of Savannah, bless the United States, bless uh, all of this, this, this country and the world. Father, with the, uh, healing, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you help us to realize uh, uh, that we need to look toward you, that we need to depend on you, that we must trust you even in the midst of a pandemic. Father, we uh, give you all the glory, honor, and praise. We ask that you uh, bless and protect each and every one of us, Father, as we are uh, uh, dealing with this pandemic, that those who may be stricken, that you heal them, dear Heavenly Father, that you bring them back to the portion of health that they once had, and that, Father, those who have lost loved ones to this pandemic that and other sicknesses and health crises, that you will uh, bless them with comfort and give them the peace that only you can give to ease their troubled heart and soul. Father, we thank you. We give you glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.